Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us today for Dementia Challenges in Emergency Departments and Hospitals. My name is John Sheehan. I'm the Associate Director of Public Health for the Alzheimer's Association, and I'll be your moderator today, along with the, the Director of Public Health, Molly French. We're so glad you could join us today to talk about how the COVID-19 crisis is exacerbating the unique vulnerabilities related to dementia and what public health specifically can do in response. We'll hear from experts from CDC later today, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And we'd like to acknowledge the cooperative agreement that allows us to hold today's presentation. While I go through a few housekeeping items, please do complete the poll you'll see to the side of your screen and tell us a little bit about yourself. And I want you to know that we are recording today's webinar to make it available to others who couldn't join us today. All lines have been placed on mute, but we have reserved the, uh, the last few minutes of today's presentation for question and answer. So please view and find the Q&A feature along the side of your screen or along the top of your screen to ask a question or submit a comment at any point during today's presentation. Before the broadcast ends, uh, we would like to collect some quick feedback from you. So please take two to three minutes and help us improve for future webinars. Next week, all, regist all registrants will receive the slide deck, a link to the recording, as well as the resources that we featured here today. But before we begin, I do want to take a quick moment to just to recognize that it is a particularly difficult and challenging time professionally and personally. Uh, we want to take a, a quick moment and thank the public health workforce out on the front lines who are doing their utmost to protect the, the health and well-being of our communities, as well as to all of our essential workers out there. Just a, a heartfelt thank you from all of us. Today's webinar is tailored more toward professionals in public health agencies, aging services, and other essential workers. If you, however, have a personal situation that you're dealing with, and may find it more useful or find additional information by going to our Alzheimer's Association main website, alz.org slash COVID-19 help, or by dialing our 24-hour helpline at 1-800-272-3900. The 24-7 helpline is available every hour of every day and is free to you. And if you uh, have a person with a situation related to dementia, please reach out for our confidential support and information. If you're just joining us, my name is John Sheehan with the Alzheimer's Association. And if you haven't yet filled out that poll, please do take a, a quick second before we close it in just a minute here. We only have 30 minutes today, but I want to give you a quick preview of what we're going to cover. And so we're going to begin with a uh, setting the stage, just a few facts before we hear from our experts from CDC to talk, uh, to talk about how the COVID-19 pandemic is, is creating special and unique challenges for people living with dementia as well as their caregivers. Today, this session, we're going to focus specifically on acute care related to emergency departments and hospitals. We're also going to hear what public health professionals can do to tailor their pandemic response to better serve this vulnerable, vulnerable population. Like I said, at the end, we'll have time for your questions and comments, so please do use that Q&A feature at any point during today's presentation. Before we close, I'll share a few key resources related to COVID-19, and like I said, after the webinar, you'll receive access to the slides and a link to the recording, as well as all of those resources we mentioned. Today, we have the pleasure and honor of learning from two CDC experts. Dr. Lisa McGuire is our first expert who we'll, hear, uh, who we'll hear from. She is the lead for CDC's Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program. She's published over 100 articles, is a member of the National Alzheimer's Project Act Federal Advisory Council, and provides leadership on other boards and national initiatives. Joining her is Dr. Nia Reed. She is an O. Rice Fellow at CDC, also with the Alzheimer's Disease and Healthy Aging Program. She completed her MA in gerontology and her PhD in sociology. But before we hear from our, our experts, since this may be the first time that some public health professionals are, are thinking about Alzheimer's or thinking about dementia in this emergency response, I'm gonna send just a few minutes to, to level set before we dive in. What is dementia, first and foremost? Dementia is, is an umbrella term for a set of sy symptoms that's characterized by the loss of cognitive function that becomes severe enough to interfere with everyday life. Dementia is not normal aging, but rather is a chronic condition that some people develop often later in life. Several diseases and several conditions cause dementia. Among them, Alzheimer's disease is the most common cause. Alzheimer's is an irreversible progressive brain disease that slowly destroys memory and eventually the ability to carry out even the simplest of tasks. 
We know that the second most common cause of dementia is vascular dementia, where decline in thinking is caused by conditions uh, that block blood flow to the brain, such as having a stroke. There are many other types of dementia out there, and more and more research is indicating that a large number of dementia cases are actually mixed type, mixed cause dementia when a person has one, what has two or more types of dementia. Regardless of the, the cause of dementia, we know that as it progresses, people with the condition rely more and more on caregivers. That's why when we think about today's topic as the COVID crisis evolves, public health professionals do need to be thinking about both the person living with dementia as well as their caregivers. And in thinking about those caregivers specifically, two pieces of data can help us further contextualize the complications COVID may cause. For over a quarter of caregivers uh, of people living with dementia, uh, they also provide care to a child or grandchild. We know that across the country, most schools have switched to virtual learning, which means that these sandwich caregivers, uh, as we call them, uh, stuck between, not stuck, I should say, but uh, between providing care between uh, a child or grandchild as well as an older person living with dementia, uh, those sandwich caregivers may be stretched thin even more so than they were before the pandemic. And we also know that dementia caregivers are more likely to be age 65 or older uh, than other caregivers for other conditions, which puts them at a high risk category for complications from COVID. As we talk today, these are facts that I want you to keep in mind uh, that can have impacts not only for both the person living with dementia, but their care, their caregivers as well. For people living with dementia and their caregivers, the COVID-19 crisis is a particularly vulnerable time. We do want you to know that most likely dementia does not increase the risk for COVID-19, but if a person with dementia has COVID or another infection, their cognitive impairment may get worse. Public health has a long history of, of working in emergency preparedness and disaster response. And today we're talking about that response and how the unique vulnerabilities associated with dementia can complicate it. What you see on your screen is the cover of the Healthy Brain Initiative Roadmap for State and Local Public Health. The CDC, Alzheimer's Association, and other HBI partners, we all work together using this roadmap to elevate Alzheimer's and all dementia as an integral component of public health practice. And one specific item that we're going to talk about today is called specifically for emergency preparedness and response to attend to those special needs of people living with dementia. This includes ensuring that they have the critical information that they need during their response, uh, as well as uh, emergency preparedness workers understanding how to, how to interact and uh, uh, attend to compassionately uh, with people who are living with dementia. Addressing these vulnerabilities will help protect the health and well being of not only those living with dementia, but also the many people that they're in contact with. And we know that even once conditions uh, improve nationwide, we're going to need sustained action in this arena. One thing that we do know is that even before the pandemic, emergency departments and hospitals were a challenging place for people living with dementia. From Healthy People 2020, we know that among adults 65 and older with dementia, nearly a quarter of their hospitalizations were preventable. We also know that dementia increases the risk for delirium and complications that are associated with delirium, which may just uh, complicate care uh, in acute care settings even further. Decision making can also be impacted. If a person living with Alzheimer's uh, has trouble communicating, as many do as the disease progresses, their cognitive impairment may prevent them from recognizing their own, uh, from recognizing when they become ill themselves, uh, when they become injured themselves, uh, which may lead to them having difficulty knowing when to contact a healthcare provider. Caregivers uh, in, in these situations are often the individuals who decide when a health situation uh, is manageable at home and when it requires more acute care. If caregivers themselves are overwhelmed, if caregivers themselves are ill, uh, then a manageable event that otherwise could be managed at home may escalate and become a, may require an emergency department visit or even a hospitalization. Today, now I'd like to invite our CDC guests, Dr. McGuire and Dr. Reed, to help us understand how COVID, how the COVID emergency is helping, uh, is, is taking a normally risky situation and making it worse. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. McGuire. We're gonna start off with a quick question 
uh, a relatively quick question uh, to help us understand the, the larger situation. Prior to the pa pandemic, what are some challenges that arise for people living with dementia when they do go to the, the emergency department or to the hospital? Things that we need to think about and how people, one of the things that we need to think about about how people's memories operate is when we think about the phrase dementia, John did a wonderful job to explain to us the various different types of dementia, but we need to think about that as a continuum that people go from, from, from a healthy cognitive functioning and that continuum grows very gradually till we start to see those disease states or disease processes in some individuals who are going to develop them. When we think about people who are living with dementia, we typically think about memory, but we also need to be thinking about reasoning and thinking and judgment and how they might interact in a situation that can be new and also potentially stressful, such as being in the ED or the hospital. The other thing that I want us to think about today, too, is that people who do have, who are living with dementia, many of them have at least one other chronic health condition. So that could be arthritis, that could be diabetes, that could be hypertension. So the thing that we need to think about when we're talking about people who are living with dementia in an emergency room setting or a hospital setting, that is they're not typically just a person living with dementia. They're living with a variety of other comor chronic, comorbid chronic health conditions that really can add to the complexity of that situation in addition to the stress and the anxiety of that. The other thing that we need to think about when we're talking about persons that are living with dementia, especially in an ED or hospital setting or situation, is as that disease progress gets towards the more severe side of that continuum, that many times it makes it really difficult for a person who does have a cognitive impairment or a dementia to live independently, manage their everyday activities such as cooking, cleaning, managing those health conditions, medications, as well as keeping up with just that general health medical appointment, which can lead to those poor health outcomes or those preventable hospitalizations that John mentioned a few moments ago. So many times we see that a caregiver really isn't a visitor. A caregiver is a person that really is essential for that memory and the recollection and helping that caregiver maintain their independence as long as possible. I'm sorry, the person with dementia maintain their independence as long as possible, as well as being in a safe, secure environment. John? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McGuire. Those, those complications, I, I think, are essential to, to understanding kind of the, the large complexity that, that you talked about in this situation. Thank you. Dr. Reed, uh, next question is for you. What is CDC observing about how COVID-19 circumstances are complicating the, the health and safety of people living with dementia in emergency departments? Thank you. Um, the first step in caring for people living with dementia in any setting is to understand that changes in behavior or worsening symptoms of dementia, dementia should be evaluated because they can be an indication of COVID-19 infection or worsening stress and anxiety. Not everyone with COVID-19 has symptoms, but when people with dementia do have COVID symptoms, they can include the following, increased agitation, increased confusion, sudden sadness, along with common COVID-19 symptoms such as cough, difficulty breathing, chills, and other symptoms. Other complications, uh, the fact that caregivers, as Dr. McGuire listed, are seen as visitors in healthcare settings instead of as essential actors in the care required for people living with dementia. Ultimately, caregivers are essential workers during the pandemic, especially caregivers of people living with advanced dementia. Healthcare providers are not always aware that they may face difficulty caring for people living with dementia, including healthcare workers who are in emergency departments. So they may have difficult difficulties because one, uh, they may not, people living with dementia may not cooperate with care and may not follow personal protective measures such as wearing a cloth, a face cloth covering or practicing social distancing, or two, they may refuse diagnostic 
procedures. Caregivers of people living with dementia, maintaining as much of a routine as possible for their loved one is essential in trying to prevent emergency department visits. But these are some of the issues in emergency departments that people living with dementia face. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Reed. That, that component of, of thinking and, and contextualizing caregivers as essential workers for the health and safety of, of their loved one with dementia, I think is, is a really unique and really necessary way to, to think about this as we go forward. Thank you. Uh, continuing with, with you, Dr. Reed, how is the COVID-19 strain on hospitals complicating the delivery of care for people living with dementia and their caregivers? Thanks, John. Uh, it's pretty similar. Caregivers are essential to disclosing important health care information for their loved ones, and the current bring in no visitors policy can be complicated to navigate in caregiver settings. So caregivers are urged to have appropriate personal protective equipment in case they are allowed to accompany loved ones, but some facilities may not allow caregivers. Hospital staffs may uh, need to be aware, including in hospital settings, that uh, they will and will possibly have difficulties with people living with dementia because they may not cooperate with care, the things that were mentioned before, and may refuse diagnostic similar across the board in emergency departments as well as um, other healthcare um, settings, other hospital settings. And those are some of the reasons and um, uh, situations that can put strains on hospitals, not having the appropriate care information for the person living with dementia and not having the person there to uh, translate that information to the healthcare workers. Thank you. That's that's a really important consideration, and it's one that we've heard of in in many different con um, uh, contexts here at the association. That caregivers do provide that necessary translation. Uh, they know that their their loved one living with dementia. They understand what the behaviors uh, may represent, what their communication strengths and uh, and setbacks are to being able to provide that translation in an emergency department with lots of things moving, lots of things going on is so essential to uh, ensuring that the the person with dementia does get the care, uh, the care and attention that that he or she needs. I do want to remind everyone that it's almost time for Q and A, so please submit your items, your questions, your comments using that Q and A feature, uh, which you can access along the side or the top of your screen. Uh, but before we open it up for, for Q&A, just one final question for Dr. Reed. Uh, because caregivers are, are so important, what happens if caregivers themselves suddenly need to go to the emergency department or, or to a hospital? Thanks, John. This is a very important question. Caregivers are urged to have a backup caregiver in case they get sick. If there are no backup options, they may consider contacting local resource centers. If caregivers do get sick at home, they are urged to follow CDC's recommended guidelines for taking care of themselves and others and make sure that they follow recommendations such as uh, wearing cloth face coverings, cleaning and disinfecting the home while still possibly maintaining care for their loved one. But, but if they don't have any backups, they should uh, log in to CDC's COVID-19 page for caring for somebody at home while taking care of yourself. Excellent, thank you, great, great recommendations. Uh, at this time, uh, thank you to all who have submitted questions and comments. Uh, Molly, would you please facilitate the Q&A for us? Yes, thank you so much, uh, John, and thanks to Dr. McGuire and Dr. Reed for helping us get a better understanding of some of the challenges. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, switch to, uh, we had our first question, which uh, I'm gonna ask for Dr. McGuire to, if, if you'd respond. Um, one of the participants is wondering if you'd talk a little bit about the risk of delirium um, among, you know, Hey, people living with dementia who have to be hospitalized. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I can. Thank you so much for that question. I mean, delirium is an important consideration uh, when we are hospitalizing older adults. 
Um, it's sometimes something that we will see with the change in the environment or due to some sort of a physiological change in a person um, due to the illness, as well as some, there's um, some data suggests that following anesthesia, that some older adults are more susceptible to a delirium that is either temporary and for some of those that tends to make, uh, can, can last for a little bit longer. So it's really important, and that's one of the things that having a caregiver available or around can do because as a caregiver, we are pretty keenly aware of the behaviors and manner, mannerisms of, that, of our loved one. And many times we can see or notice as a caregiver that there might be a change that a staff member who is coming in and out of the room periodically may not notice. So one of the advantages of having a caregiver there is they might be able to recognize some of those signs or symptoms of delirium that the medical staff can be alerted to. So what I'm trying to say is it's an important consideration that we need to be aware of and that having the caregiver or someone who's more familiar with that person's normal behavior there might allow us to identify it sooner rather than later. Thank you. That and that's just um, just so important to be thinking about and trying to attend to is that delirium aspect. We know that for people living with dementia, even under normal circumstances, just that emergent going to emergency department, going to hospital, it's a big disruption. Um, and with the cognitive impairment, it it's hard to process that experience. Um, and a lot of times people leave. The hospital, um, particularly after hospitalization, um, you know, with more cognitive impairment um, and perhaps less functioning than when they went in. So if we can avoid delirium, that's important. And Dr. Um, Dr. Reed or Dr. McGuire is hoping that um, leaving the hospital and emergency department, you know, there's a need to be thinking also about those care transitions. Someone may leave the hospital, go to, for example, a need, um, go to a rehabilitation center or need some short-term care. Um, tell us a little bit more about how that process can be improved, whether it's someone leaving the hospital after uh, COVID infection or for another reason. Well, I'll start, Nia, and then I'll let you finish up then, Dr. Reed. I think what's important is the communication um, between the, the hospital setting and the family to know exactly what's going on and what kind of care the person needs as well as being very explicit about the medication. Um, so that information can get communicated to the, the new facility that they're transitioning to, um, either from the family and or from the other medical professionals. I think to really ease some of that stress and some of the anxiety that the person with dementia might be experiencing during this is to have one or two things or even people that they recognize and are meaningful to them. Whether it's a certain blanket that's soft that they like or whether it's fuzzy slippers as long as those are acceptable or a certain photograph. But something that will allow that that, that person values and recognizes and can kind of take some of that stress and anxiety away, and maybe they might find some comfort with whatever that object or person might be, even though they're in a stressful situation and in an unfamiliar environment. Dr. Reed, would you like to add anything? Yes, thank you, Dr. McGuire. Those were really great uh, suggestions. Uh, one more suggestion I would add is to try to keep uh, the routine as uh, consistent as possible, even in a new facility for the person living with dementia, routines are very important. So even in a new setting, trying to maintain a routine that the person had prior to going into the new um, setting. I love that practical um, advice. It's doable, it's feasible, and um, very, very important. And this one of the things that we haven't other, Oh, yes, go ahead, Dr. McGuire. One other thing, I, I apologize. I think one other thing is to make sure that the staff in the facility that they're transitioning to understand that they do have dementia. And 
from personal experiences in my my family situation, the understanding of what is expect how a dementia patient might behave or react react to different things might be unclear because of some lack of knowledge of the staff. So I think it's important to make sure that the staff knows that the person has dementia and that there are certain things that may be triggers to them um, and they may you know, make the situation worse. So I think it's always not, it's best to not assume that the people that you're working with understand dementia and also not to assume that they'd already know. Yeah, and that is just so fundamental is that notation of a potential diagnosis or even suspected dementia because it, it affects their whole um, treatment plan and then subsequent with the discharge. One of the, we've read in, and seen in the news so much, just a lot of that the COVID pandemic is not having um, it's really disproportionately impacting some populations. And Dr. Reed, I was hoping you would uh, tell us a little bit about some of the dementia-related disparities we need to be thinking about um, with regards to emergency department hospitals. Thank you. One of the so we should be thinking about the different needs of people living with dementia in long-term care facilities with memory unit and memory uh, care units and wings and those and some of those differences include the rapid spread of long-term and of COVID-19 in long-term care facilities and being able to visit um, those facilities as opposed to people living with dementia in community settings. Um, being exposed to possible COVID-19 infection by caregivers, especially if their caregivers are back at work. So alternate caregiving duties are not as easy to come by in community settings as it is in long-term care facilities, but also those who live in long-term care facilities are in um, situations where they are exposed to more people who are out in a general public and then who come and care for them in that long-term care facility. So there are some health disparities between those who live in uh, long-term care facilities as opposed to those who live in community settings. And we are uh, constantly getting new information and new data in to help, to try to find ways to help mitigate the uh, excessive um, COVID-19 infections in long-term care facilities as opposed to with those people who are living with dementia outside of those settings. Um, yes, an excellent point. And that just, you know, brings to mind too, Dr. Reed, that, you know, person living with dementia, um, whether they're in the community or um, went to the ED hospital from a long-term care facility, they're in contact with a lot of people, and that's why there is that need for that strong public health response. I want to thank everyone who participated um, and joined us with the Q&A. Uh, we'll be responding to the questions we didn't get to uh, in writing in the uh, next day or two. And I will be uh, switching it back to John Sheehan, my colleague, uh, to close us out. Thank you so much. And thank you, um, Dr. Reed and Dr. McGuire for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Molly. And just to yeah. echo that, we really appreciate the, the expertise of CDC uh, sharing that with us today. Uh, we do just to be mindful of everyone's time. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit quick on these final few slides here, but we do want to improve. Uh, please take just two to three minutes to fill out a feedback form. Let us know what was useful and where we could uh, where we can improve on. Molly will place that link in the chat so you can easily copy and paste. Just take two to three minutes of your time. As you can imagine, we've only just touched the tip of the iceberg uh, on on this issue. It's uh, the needs, the healthcare needs. The, the medical care required for people living with dementia is very complex. Uh, the COVID response is very complex. And so there's a lot of information. There's a lot that we're learning each day. Please do take a, a look at CDC's informational resources for older adults at cdc.gov slash aging slash COVID-19. These include guidance uh, specifically for retirement communities, owners of shared housing, long-term care facilities, and nursing homes, just for instance. We'll be sure to include these, these links in the follow-up email as well.
Uh, we'd like to also point you to our new uh, microsite on ALZ.org at ALZ.org slash public health dash COVID-19. This is where you can find tip sheets uh, that cover the, the challenges, the public health tips and techniques that we covered today, as well as additional resources and additional settings, uh, as well as ALZ.org slash COVID-19 help, again, for that, that personal situation if you are experiencing one. We have a customizable tool for uh, emergency medical services, instructing them on how to interact uh, appropriately and compassionately uh, with people living with dementia. This is available to customize on a state basis. Please also find that uh, on our microsite uh, online. And once again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a very complex topic, uh, but we're, we're so appreciative of the public health workforce out there on the front line beginning to address this from a public health perspective considering those, those people with dementia and their unique, uh, their unique vulnerabilities. Thank you to CDC, and thank you for joining us. Take care, everyone.